all for coming out. Um, I really didn't imagine so many people would come out. Um, and so um, I know some of you, but not all of you. And so I'm going to say my name, and if we could just go around and everyone say their name, that would be great. So I'm Rick Lee. I'm John Karabaitis. Bob Lichtenberg. David Lafferty. Dave Lee. Tom Wiseman. Sorry? Okay. I'm Katerina. Uh, Ron Blake. Blake. Okay. Uh, TJ Watson. Bill Martin. So, uh, I have thought since I'm wearing the amazing fantastic drink coat. jacket, um, I think Bill needs to start because like, I just have, like, a orange wool sweater on, and that is fabulous. I got it in Beijing. I know. Um, so, uh, and how long should we each talk for? 15 minutes, maybe? 20 minutes? Yeah. Minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right. So we agreed we'd talk about uh, a little bit of what is materialism and why is it important, or why do we care whether we're materialists or not. Uh, and... For me, there's also this question that goes with that, and I'll be interested to hear what uh, Professor Lee says about this, too, in terms of, um, you know, why is materialism in a way subtle? Why, in a way, do you sort of have to sneak up on it when it seems like you could just be a materialist in the same way that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm going into a memory lapse. Who was it who refuted Barclay by kicking a rock? Samuel oh. Johnson. Yeah, yeah, right. The way you know Samuel Johnson refuted Barclay, where you can just say, well, yeah, materialism, here it is. What else do you need? And part of the problem with that is that uh, I think to really be a materialist, uh, you have to look out for two things. Uh, the main thing, probably, that's the most dangerous if you're trying to be a materialist is to watch out for a kind of reductivist approach, and I like the way that this question will stand out sometimes better in some kinds of analytic philosophy than, than sometimes in some continental philosophy. So uh, I've recently been teaching a course in the honors program on philosophy of mind, as they used to call it, and the question of consciousness and language and whatnot, the role of meaning and consciousness and lang language and consciousness. And I've been using a book by uh, someone I like quite a lot, who I think of as a very good, broad-minded, analytic philosopher, very open-minded, named Owen Flanagan. And Flanagan, I think, does a very good job of addressing the fact that it's very easy, especially in that field, to fall into what's called the NCC view, the neuronal correlations of consciousness view, as if uh, every uh, bit of consciousness can just be described by taking sort of three-dimensional pictures of brain states from moment uh, to moment, or just to describe uh, what neurons are firing and whatnot. And as you know, I mean, in a way, this is not only a, a very prevalent reductive materialism among theorists, uh, but, for example, in the medical professions and in the... In the uh, uh, psychotherapeutic professions, uh, the idea that we have a pretty good map of the way the brain works and we can we can uh, tweak it in various ways with psychoactive drugs and whatnot, uh, 
um, is extremely prevalent is basically completely kind of, I guess you'd call it pharmaceutical materialism or something that's completely taken over uh, that conception and it has, you know, huge effects in the world and whatnot. I know I experienced it a few years ago when I was given uh, pain medicine that wasn't treating uh, nerve damage that I had from an accident I was in. And um, basically I would uh, say to the assistant of the pain doctor, look, I'm in immense pain and this medicine isn't working. And a couple times I woke up at six in the morning to find the pain doctor standing there. You know, it was not a pleasant thing really to just open my eyes. And here's this guy and he basically started lecturing me on how good the medicine I was getting is, you know, and it's doing this, that, and the other thing, and I'm firing on this and not doing that. And supposedly one benefit was that it wouldn't provoke euphoria. You know, I, I needed euphoria at that point. I didn't quite see what was would be wrong if I had a little euphoria. And um, um, but basically cursing me out because, uh, you know, there was nothing wrong with the medicine. The problem was with me, right? And that, I mean, that comes from a certain view of how the mind works. And it's very tempting. It's very tempting to go to that neuronal correlations of consciousness view. Um, but there's so many things that are going on in the world that just can't be adequately, adequately explained that way. And so, uh, you know, that's why we need something more like a subtle materialism that we have to sneak up on a little bit. And, uh, and we have to be careful about the other direction, you know, that's the other temptation, is to sort of fill in gaps um, with something that turns out to be supernatural or does some job of being supernatural or goes in a theological direction. Um, and it's a little bit like, I don't know, there's a famous uh, New Yorker cartoon that you may have seen because it's been reproduced so much, but it's where there's a scientist at a blackboard and they fill one side of the board with equations and the other side of the equations, but in the middle it says, you know, then a miracle happens, right? And, you know, that way of supposedly explaining, and of course you're not explaining something there, you can't base new experiments on the miracle, etc. And so, somehow to go in between those two sides of things, it turns out to be exceedingly difficult, a lot more difficult than kicking a rock. And I, I suppose just to even address that, I don't think that uh, Samuel Johnson uh, refuted Barclay by kicking a rock. And so that, in a way, is sort of the story that we're, I think, trying to, uh, trying to under understand here. So then just to back up a little bit, so, yeah, the, the philosopher I've really been engaged with a lot in the last 10 years, as, uh, as some of you know, is Alain Badiou. Uh, he was born in 1937, is still alive and going quite strong today. Um, and the, the big thing that really drew me toward him is that he was part of the Maoist milieu in Paris uh, back in the days of 1968, post-1968. And I come from a similar background in the United States, well, with some very significant differences, but I also come out of that milieu myself. And one of the things I like about Badiou is that he tried to make philosophical sense out of Maoism, and then seeing that Maoism had reached the limits of what it might give us, he tried to make sense of these limits and what might come next. And so that's uh, appealing to me. And then more recently, I've been going in this very, I'm sure, strange direction. Um, where I've been focusing on a side of Mao that I don't think has really been investigated uh, to any depth. And I think it could be expressed in terms of three interrelated elements. Uh, first, of all the major leaders and theoreticians of Marxist revolution, uh, Mao was not from a cultural background shaped by Western monotheism. And secondly, Mao uh, was raised uh, a Buddhist by his mother, who was a devout Buddhist. Um, and this hasn't really been explored by historians, really, at any depth whatsoever. And I, I even investigated this when I've been in China. And it's something they tend to just stay away from altogether. And then thirdly, that Mao was resolutely anti-Confucian. Confucian. 
And then this, I think, now was closer to the spirit of the original impulses of Buddhism in India, which broke with the prevailing caste and gender systems. But then as Buddhism came into China, it blended with Taoism, and it left the political spirit of Confucianism. And I think Mao also tends to run counter uh, uh, to that. But that's a problem, and I think it's a very interesting problem, because Confucianism just runs so amazingly deep in uh, Chinese culture. And now it's very much being actively promoted by the Communist Party of China itself, because as they go ever, ever more into uh, a capitalist uh, system, they've lost very much sense of social glue and uh, of, of any kind of spiritual uh, sense of a project in their society. And, um, Rick and I uh, even uh, experienced some of this and went to see this. It was a great day, actually, when we went to Lu Xuan Park in Shanghai mm -hmm. and watched um, the Revolutionary Song Movement in action. And being the two Westerners there, a lot of people wanted to talk with us, too, about, you know, why are you interested in what we're doing and all that. And what you get there is uh, in Wuxuan Park in Shanghai and, and apparently in many parks throughout. Uh, I've seen it in Beijing and other, other cities, too. Um, are people who grew up under socialism, grew up under Mao, and then just one fine day they were told, well, we're not doing that anymore. And they really just have their legs cut out from under them and, uh, and are kind of lost people in a lot of ways and trying to recover that. And it's mostly nostalgia. I mean, I won't really say that it's especially radical or anything. It's mostly nostalgia. But for the rest of the people and the younger people especially, they're filling in this kind of spiritual void uh, with Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism. And one of my arguments or my my big argument that I am trying to pursue, and this comes from both Buddhism and from Badu with sort of Mao and Plato in between, is that instead of filling in the void, so to speak, it's more important to try to develop the void. It's more important to sort of let the void do what it does. Um, and in fact, uh, my twist on, you know, the Parmenidean question that Plato takes up, so Parmen Parmenides famously said, uh, of nothing, nothing can be said, is that it's not so much what to say about it, but in a certain sense, what to do with it, what to do with the void. And then there's that question, well, that's pretty weird. I mean, that doesn't sound like materialism exactly, or what would be a materialism of the void? So this is, uh, this is a question uh, 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 for me. Um, now, for Badiou, one of the things he's very interested, obviously many philosophers uh, in the Western tradition and in the Buddhist traditions, I wouldn't say necessarily in uh, the other, um, the other uh, uh, Asian traditions, but certainly in Buddhism, um, there's that whole tradition of emptiness, of nothingness, of void. Um, and my sense of it is that um, it's already, at least in Buddha, um, pitched in a, at least something like a materialist direction in the sense that there's nothing really supernatural about it. So at least if you look at some of the basic ideas in Buddhism, like the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and the Bodhisattva vows and the other kinds of uh, vows that one can take, there's nothing supernatural that's required of doing any of these things. Um, and furthermore, I think there's a basis in Indian mathematics um, to not conceive of the void in a kind of theological way. So one interesting thing is that Indian mathematics, mathematics in India, Hindustan, was really very advanced a long time before the Greek mathematicians and the Arabic mathematicians came along. And even for many years after, after these great figures like Euclid and whatnot started to develop there was a sense in which anything having to do with nothing was almost a kind of demonic sort of thing. And so there was a fear of zero, there was a fear of the nothing, and then there, of course there was the discourse of lack, basically, that runs from Aristotle to Freud, basically, and has all these kinds of ramifications for how we understand uh, gender and whatnot. But in its original kind of conception, 
um, it's already sort of secular enough and sort of free of uh, the supernatural. And then, of course, as these things develop and as things tend to develop, they often assimilate that, uh, you know, they often assimilate those sorts of things. One of the interesting things in Flanagan's work is he does try to deal with Buddhism and in the book I've been using in my class, it's called The Really Hard Problem, which is how to explain consciousness in the material world in an adequately materialist way without being reductive about it. He brings in these insights from Buddhism, but it's mainly Tibetan Buddhism. And that's very interesting because, I mean, Tibetan Buddhism does tend to be very rich with all kinds of supernatural looking things and spirits and demons. And, of course, there's an understanding of that, I think, at least by some, that these are more metaphorical sorts of ways of talking. But then there are others who really get quite motivated by things that I would say take us more in that direction. And I find that to be a little bit of a problem. So one of his projects, and he carries this forward in a subsequent book called uh, The Bodhisattva's Brain, is to naturalize Buddhism. But I think it's harder to try to naturalize Tibetan Buddhism because it's very much loaded with these kind of entities that it's hard to hard to uh, bring fully back in a naturalistic way. Whereas in the more rude impulses, it tends to be pretty naturalized uh, uh, to begin with. Okay, but why is that interesting or why is that important? Well, in the scheme of things with uh, looking at Badu, well, you probably know uh, that Badu uh, uh, goes back to, uh, he has this idea of a return to Plato. And it seems to me that one of the stories in Plato that he's most interested in, uh, and it makes a lot of sense for us politically, uh, so that, for example, even when and what is to be done makes uh, an oblique reference to this story, the allegory of the cave. Lenin says that, well, when we, uh, when we tell people that they're going to have to go against their own society and go against their social system, don't expect them to be happy. He says they'll tear us limb from limb, which is, which is a line right out of the allegory of the cave. Most Marxists don't really either know that or, or make a note of that. I think the allegory of the cave is basically a kind of Buddhist story. And I even think that probably historically there was some way in which that must have gone up and down the Silk Road and somehow informed some thinking that was going on not only by Plato, but probably by Parmenides and Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans as well. And one of the thing, one of the aspects of this, and this doesn't quite go directly to materialism, that I think is very under theorized in that story, and even in Badiou's own version. So you probably know that uh, Badiou has done his own version of Plato's Republic. Uh, he calls it a hyper translation. It's sort of his interpretation of uh, Republic. Um, but even there, it's very interesting. In his version of the allegory, I don't know that enough attention, and maybe people here who do classical scholarship can speak to those who have done more of this, but you know, there's a point when uh, our individual uh, escapes from the cave. And one thing to note about that, this is a purely contingent thing. They're not trying to escape. They don't really know they're in, they don't know they're in chains to begin with. They don't know they're trapped to begin with. When they come out of the cave, so it's it's very interesting to analyze the different phases of this story. When they come out of the cave, there's a moment where, at first, this person is just completely, everything that's in their mind is just obliterated. In other words, you know, there's some relationship to the void there, and the point is, it's absolutely necessary for what comes next. I mean, for Badu, what he calls this the evacuation of the previous situation. But I don't think he fully quite grasps, and I don't really see that many interpreters really grasp the material role that the void is playing in the possibility of something. And so in Buddhism, I think this is the aspect of letting go. And I really see this mostly uh, more in Zen Buddhism than in other forms of Buddhism. I think Zen is more the practice, really, of letting go. And if only for a moment, if only to get a glimpse. And then we see this repeated, I think, 
the allegory of the cave, but I think in actually a very a more Buddhist way than you see in Plato, but we see him repeated in the person who Badiou thinks is the, you know, he calls him the exemplary political militant for our time, namely St. Paul. It's been very interesting talking about this in uh, our largest Catholic university in the United States where nobody's read the Bible. And um, <clears throat> and so they don't, you know, I'll, I'll go into a class naively and say, uh, uh, no, what, do, what is St. Paul doing at the beginning of the Book of Acts? Like, Killing Christians. Who's St. Paul? No, they, that's the thing. See, they don't say that. They don't, they don't even know who this guy is, you know. And, and it, it, it is an extraordinary story. I, I, maybe they're confused because he's called Saul there. Well, there is that. But no, I don't think that's the problem. I don't think that's the problem. Um, uh, it sort of takes me back to uh, back when George Harrison was dying, and he had said publicly that he was dying because he had, uh, smoked heavily his whole life. I was talking with a young woman who I who works at a convenience store that I went to often, and she was smoking outside the store, and I said to her, well, when George Harrison dies, and it's because he smoked all his life, would that make you reconsider smoking? And her answer was, he was George Harrison. So, you know, <laughs> that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of situation we're in here with, with this guy, Paul. And it's, I think it's an extraordinary story. I mean, I've read, I, I, Acts, Acts and, you know, Acts is part of the same book as Luke, as the Gospel of Luke, and Bible scholars call it Luke Acts, and it's, to me, it's the most fascinating book in the New Testament, because first you get the story of Jesus and his movement, and then after Jesus is gone, you get the story of what's that movement going to do, and you get this guy, Paul, who is a very serious persecutor of Christians. You don't get this, I think, in kind of a sanitized Sunday school version. You just think you get the version that Paul is just maybe sitting around at home watching the Bulls game and sort of thinking, man, those Christians just take me off. But, I mean, instead, it's clear, you know, like in the story of the stoning of, of uh, Stephen, uh, the first martyr, right, that it says Paul was looking on approvingly I mean, I get the impression that he organized the thing. You know, it wasn't just he happened to be standing by. He was part of that. And then for him to go through this experience where, again, the void is very much thematized because he's struck, he's on the road to Damascus, he's struck blind, he's going to persecute some more Christians, he's struck, you know, blind and deaf and dumb. And again, I wonder at the material role of that void. And what it means then to really embrace that within a materialism. I'm not saying, I'm saying I have that fully worked out. It's clearly a key category in what Badu is doing, and then he wants to keep it non-supernatural by using mathematics to secularize it, so to speak. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm working on that. And it seems to me that the Buddhist aspect of that sort of comes in the fact that, as Plato says in the allegory, it's hard to get out of the cave, but it's even harder the fact that then you have to go back in. And what makes you go back in? So in the story of when Buddha let everything go and basically was up against the whole sort of, well, he studied all these spiritual traditions for 15 years and whatnot, and some progress, but some stuff that's just completely muddled and whatnot. And he basically says, I'm going to sit under this tree until something happens. And there's that moment where it's everything is just let go of. And the truth that really emerges there is, is emptiness. It's the truth of emptiness. And then... But it's all, so to speak, in his head, just like with Paul. This is, the, you know, this to me is the interesting thing. So, if you look at Acts, the fascinating thing is, so Paul at the beginning, he's, he's Saul, he's a persecutor. He has this experience that nobody else has, nobody else sees what's going on. And then by the end of the book of Acts, he's not only told these guys, Peter and James, who were the, and Mary probably, who were the leaders of the, of the Jesus movement at that point, hey, I'm not only one of you guys now, but I actually understand this thing better than you do if I should really be the leader of it. 
you know, and that to me is a fascinating aspect of that whole story because I think the Sunday school version is, oh, Peter, Paul, James, Mary, all of them, they were just all, you know, they treated Mary like crap, obviously, but, you know, all of that is just, uh, you know, they were all charming and everything, where it's quite likely that when <coughs> Peter and Paul were themselves both crucified, uh, that they weren't even on speaking terms, that they probably hated each other, because there was some, some deal where Paul was accused of basically raising a bunch of money, but maybe taking it himself or something. Yeah. Um, but so imagine that. I mean, so imagine what could possibly happen as Paul says, and as Heideggerians somehow never seem to remember that this language comes from, from the book of Acts, that in the twinkling of an eye, in the blink of an eye, he becomes, you know, as it says, a changed person, a changed man. And he goes from being a persecutor to being somebody who now feels and is going to go tell the leaders of the Jesus movement, hey, I've got an insight into this that you don't have. And so... Yeah, now how does that all go very directly to materialism? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll quit now because it's obviously still more of a longer story. But my point is that um, there's something that the void is doing in there that I think is very much under-theorized, under-thematized. So I, I think I'll just leave it there and we can develop some other things. Oh, nice. nice. Okay, thank you. Um, so I didn't know Bill was going to talk about the void. Um, but... Um, Philosophically, when you talk about materialism, it seems like a relatively simple position. Namely, to speak like in propositions, the, the proposition would be something like, whatever is, is matter. Um, and so that seems relatively straightforward and easy to say. Um, except that, once you start thinking that through, um, it seems very much like the beginning, let's say, of Hesiod's Theogony, where he begins by saying simply, first came chaos. Um, that is, it seems to have more in common with a theological position than anything else. That is, it, it actually turns the notion of matter into a kind of something you either believe or don't believe. Um, and so... Once materialism becomes more or less close to a kind of theology, um, then I start thinking, well, but Marx called himself a materialist, and, and he was, seemed not to be so interested in theology, and so what could this position called materialism be? And it turns out that um, it dissolves very quickly in your fingertips in ways that you would not expect. Um, and so then there's an obvious solution to this problem, and that is to say, well, anyone who makes the claim everything is matter is actually not a materialist, but turns out to be, in fact, the opposite of a materialist, either a theologian or what in the history of philosophy is called an idealist, or that is everything that is, is a construction of my thought. Um, and the more you start playing around the edges of this notion of matter and materialism, the more you come to think maybe this thing that stands at the center, namely matter, when you ask, what is that? The most general form of the answer to that question is something like, it's that which is other than thought. That is, there is something there that just is not whatever thought does and not whatever thought can grasp. In this way, I think, I, I've come to a position very close to, you know, Bill's fascination with this notion of a void. So, in philosophy, we're used to, like, chasing things down. Like, we keep asking... We're, we're, we're kind of like two-year-olds. We always ask, why? But why? But why? But why? And, and it seems like the answer to that question would be some reason, right? But whatever would answer that question, since it's a reason, would be something available to thought. And yet, there is always this confrontation of something other than thought. 
So even, I think, a non-materialist like Hegel acknowledges this, because when you say, for example, that reality, whatever is, is the construction of thought, he still acknowledges this kind of intractable, intractable problem, namely that thought always is of something, and that of always points outside of thought. And so there is always this, this dependency on something that can't ever be fully taken in, and void is probably a really good word for that. I'm going to leave that on the table for a moment. And now I'm going to start with a story. Um, two years ago, my father's sister, my Aunt Betty, died. And um, I went to her wake and to her funeral. And um, it was the first time I had seen her sister-in-law, who turns out to have been my godmother, or she still is my godmother, um, my Aunt Peggy. Um, and so, as a brief aside, my great-grandfather and his brother, our family story goes, I've recently learned this is not true, but our family story goes that they founded the Pipefitters Union in Chicago. And except for me and my father, we are the only two men on that side of the family who have, well, I shouldn't say that, except for my father, my father is the only man on that side of the family to have never been a Pipefitter. I was a pipe fitter because I was kicked out of college as an undergraduate. It's a long story, and, and kids don't do drugs. That's the moral of that story. Um, but um, so I hadn't seen my Aunt Peggy in years. And so here we are, and I see relatives that I met once maybe when I was a child, like, you know, my father's cousin's wife and, and the daughter of those people. and. Like, I, I have them somewhere in the back of my memory, but my Aunt Peggy took me by hand, and here's how she introduced me to everyone, especially the priest who officiated the funeral. She said, this is my godson, Rick. He's a professor of philosophy. Now, my Aunt Peggy and most of the people in my family have never been to college at all, and so have no idea what it is I do. Um, they, they don't know what philosophy is. They don't even know what being a professor in a university of anything is. And yet, somehow, her introduction, here's my godson Rick, he's a professor of philosophy. I thought, somehow, they all live their lives to make my life possible. And they had no idea what that could mean. They projected something out into the future that they could not imagine. So, what does this have to do with materials? So, I'd like to give you one text. This comes from the uh, early 20th century philosopher Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin. Um, and um, this comes from a text that up until recently was translated as Theses on the Philosophy of History, but actually its proper title, which it's now translated under, is On the Concept of History. And there's this, and, and it all comes in these, these number of, oh, I don't have enough for everyone, so if maybe you could do every other one or something, because I really thought no one would show up. So, um, what book did you put this on? So this is, um, uh, it's from this translation, which is Walter Benjamin's Selected Writings, Volume 4, um, edited by Island and Jennings, published by Harvard University in our Harvard University Press in 2003, which is a better translation than the earlier ones. I, I, I have to admit that. Um, so I, I've left out the first thesis, which I, I quite frankly to this day don't understand, and it has to do with this 
Turkish machine that could beat everyone at playing chess, and it turned out that there was actually a little puppet inside who was playing. Um, and I have some ideas about that, but I didn't want to cloud everything that's going on. There's a little person inside. Yeah. What did I say? Puppet. Oh, yeah, there's a little person. Yeah, yeah, sorry. There's a little person inside. Sorry. Like the Turk. Yeah. But he doesn't mean that in a racist way whatsoever. Um, and I'm pretty sure so, he does. Yeah, no, I <laughs> That was ironic. Uh, sorry. Um, so, what, what, what I find interesting about Thesis 2, or Concept 2, or, or Part 2, um, comes a little bit at the end, but he begins by talking about the fact that somehow our existence on the earth is, we don't come from ourselves. And that's an obvious fact, and yet that has consequences. Um, and one of the consequences, he says, is that, and I'm looking now on what is, says 390, so halfway through this, he says, the past carries with it a secret index by which it is referred to redemption. Now, so... I find this striking because redemption is a theological category that is ultimately will be saved. Like this life is a complete and total disaster and misery. But, you know, don't worry, it'll all work out because then you'll see later God and everything will be great. But here Benjamin is saying, no, it, it turns out that without even this notion, the past is already somehow related to something other than the past, and he calls that redemption. And then he, um, jumping down a few lines, he says, then our coming was expected on earth. That is, we are the projection of the past, and so, and, and what's interesting for me is, the word Benjamin uses in German is erwarten, which could mean both expected and just like they were waiting around for us, right? So expectation sounds like you know what this thing will be, but erwarten can also just mean we are awaiting. We're, we're, we're waiting around. Whatever would stop that waiting, we're not sure. We'll know it when it comes. So I don't want to, to force either expectation or awaiting. Um, but so... Um, our existence was expected, he says, and then he goes on to say, um, then, like every generation that came before us, that preceded us, we have been endowed with a weak messianic power, a power on which the past has a claim. And here's a moment, so you think about these two things together. So, okay, it's a weak messianic power. We could talk about what that means. But when you think about what the power that a messiah would have, the one who's going to resolve, dissolve, solve all problems and make them better, you think that's a power that no one could claim. But he's now here claiming that we have this power related to redemption, and the past is making a claim on it. So now when I think about this, our arrival on earth was being waited for. And I think we were the hopes of the past. That's our power. That is, we could make good. That's another way of translating redemption. We could make good on the hopes of the past. And therefore... Every moment we are alive, we are always claimed by something in the past. Now, in every one of these theses, Benjamin calls this materialism. Right? And I'm not sure why he calls this materialism. There are other ideas um, he gives later on, namely that... Um, History is written by the victors, 
right? So everything we take as obvious is in fact not so obvious from the perspective of the past that it makes a claim on us. And so in some way, we constantly always have to undo the way in which, which history is written. And how is history written? Benjamin says, because the winners always carry the spoils of the war in a procession. And what are those spoils of war? He says, they're the cultural goods. Hegel, Heidegger, Kant, Plato, Aristotle, those are all the spoils of the winners. They are, and, and this leads Benjamin to say later on in this essay, there is no document of culture that is not a document of barbarism because it has always been won. So now he links this notion of the past that we are but one possible future and we could make good on it. He's now linking it to these material goods that we have spiritualized perhaps away from the past that we're supposed to redeem. I'll leave that aside. One more text that I don't quite fully understand. Um, and so I only have ten copies of that as well. I'm sorry. Um, so... This text... Um, Marx wrote a, a book called Contributions to the Critique of Political Economy. And he wrote this, this comes from what he wrote as an introduction to that book, but the book was published without that introduction. No. So now, in, in, our, in the, the way in which Marx's works have been collected, this is either published as an introduction to what is called the Grundrisse, or it's an appendix to the Grundrisse. So the Grundrisse, um, for those of you who don't know, and there's no reason necessarily why you should, is the book that Marx thought he would write that then he wrote Capital instead. Um, and I just read this great thing that the publishers of Capital, so they had uh, Mark, they'd agreed to publish this text of Marx, and so they, they're constantly on his case, like, where is it? You said you're going to do it, and where is it, and so on. And there's one sentence, um, and, and maybe, I, I don't know, at a certain stage this might not make sense, but at another stage it does. And he says, no, I'll have it to you shortly, because now I see the whole thing, and the only thing left is to write it. <laughs> um, and so, okay. But anyhow, so this comes... Now, um, in this introduction, Marx is talking about, if you want to talk about economy, where do you start? So he constantly pinpoints three main factors in talking about the economy. He talks about consumption, he talks about distribution, and he talks about production. And it's not immediately clear, like... Does consumption drive production and therefore distribution? Does di distribution drive consumption and therefore production? And so on. And so most of the introduction deals with this. But then Marx comes here in this section. And by the way, this is a text that you find discussions of in, uh, for example, the early 20th century French philosopher Louis F. de Serre the 20th century French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Um, this is a text that keeps coming up over and over and over again in philosophy. So, I want to begin with the second paragraph uh, of section three, and this is where he's dealing with the method of political economy. So he says, like, it, it seems like it's correct to begin with the real and concrete. So I take this as saying, like, look, we're economists, so what we're dealing with is like what people consume, what they want, what they buy, what they sell, and so on. So just look out, like the shit is there. Just like look out and see what's going on. And okay, so now you might not say, okay, buying, selling, whatever, um, that might all be derivative, but you know what's out there? There are people, 
right? And that's concrete. I just look out, and there are people. They have needs. They have wants. They they make things. They they need to survive. So, population is probably the best way to begin. And here he has in mind two classical economists, um, David Ricardo and Adam Smith, who both begin with population. So you look out and you see, okay, here's a number of people. Um, and you could see why this might be concrete. So imagine you have a, a bit of land, you have to grow food and so on, and you have more people there than you could grow food for. This becomes an economic problem and so on. So Smith and Ricardo both begin there and they think this is the origin of the issue. So he says, okay, yeah, that's great. Except, you know what? It turns out that population, which I look out and I see people, but that turns out actually to be an abstraction. Even though it's the first thing I see. Like when I look out, bam, there are people. But that's an abstraction because it turns out that it is actually composed, or as he'll come later to say, determined. And it's determined by classes. And classes now are not, in fact, totally concrete because they're an abstraction if I'm not familiar with what determines that, namely wage, labor, capital, and so on. We're not yet at the concrete because those are also abstractions because I can't understand any of that unless I understand exchange, division of labor, prices, and so on. So Marx's claim here is that what I need immediately is what he comes to call a chaotic conception or another way to translate this would be representation um, of the whole. Like this is something that's there but I don't know what it actually is. When I look out and I see it, I'm not sure what it is. And so he now proposes not what you would think is actual materialism, like my eyeballs made of matter, mostly water, and like light is out there and it's like bouncing off and we could trace that like using the science and whatever and, and so on. And then I get that. Rather, he says, no, it turns out that I have to, and he comes finally to say, expropriate the concrete in thought and make it thought's property. Um, now, this is in a way a turning away from what you normally would consider to be matter. And yet Marx constantly calls this materialism. So. Could you repeat that expression? Uh, expropriate. Uh, Concrete in thought. In thought, yeah. And make it, it's so, for those of you who geek out on these things, the German word is anzueigen, right? So one of the ways this might be interesting, I don't know, is, so some of you might know Heidegger, but so eigen is the origin of the, or stands at the center of eigentlich, eigentlichkeit, authenticity, right? And it all has to do with making one's own, right? Making something one's own. Um, and what I would eventually um, argue about this is that you can only make, so the concrete could only be made thoughts own on the basis of a recognition of a dramatic difference between that thing and thought. And maybe, I didn't plan on saying this, but this could tie back up with what Bill was saying, this is not unrelated to this notion of void, right? So this notion that that is different, and I, when I make it thought, when, when it's made thought's own, we can call that materialism only when that difference is also noted and marked, right? So that materialism can't be, look, everything that is is matter, and then how do I know that? Well, I have a materialist, uh, it's physics and light and eyeballs and so on, and up to consciousness and neurons and so on, but maybe it just is this recognition of otherness and marking that otherness um, now, then the other side is, then why not abandon thought? 
right? Why not just say, look, the, the whole problem we get into is thought. And I think Marx here gives us the reason why. That as long as we take what is given as what is, we won't understand anything at all about the way in which our society works, how production works, how our lives work, um, and so on. So these are the two texts that I'm constantly trying to understand because they both claim materialism and yet neither of them say stuff is just matter. It's as simple as that. Um, and uh, so I'll leave it at that. Can I add one little thing just at the end there? Yeah. I mean, so part of what's interesting is that the abandoning thought path has been so much of what after Marx became the Marxist traditions. Yeah. You know, that's, that's right. the that's the fascinating thing. There's just always this drive. Let's, you know, yeah, he wrote that cool book and it's filled with abstractions and then he wrote the notebooks that before that that became the group, you know, that didn't get published until, I don't know, they didn't really publish the Grimmeries until like the 70s, yeah. like 1970s or something. So 72, I think, maybe. Yeah, so almost 100 years after Marx died. And, and you know, well, yeah, and that's all, yeah, that just shows that Marx was a super smart guy, so therefore communism is right or something. But now, let's get on with abandoning thought so we can, you know, get down to the real deal. And that's <clears throat> It's just an extraordinary thing when you think about it. I mean, so it's had horrible ramifications. <laughs> yeah, really horrible. And so, this, I, I didn't plan on talking about this, and if you want me to stop. Um, so, Bill, it turns out, is um, among all the things he talked about, is a, a, a really great um, uh, bass guitar player. That, too. Um, but a, a, a really great a uh, person to go to to figure out what the hell this philosopher Jacques Derrida is ever talking about. And for most of my life, I hated this one book of Derrida's named Spectres of Marx. And um, so this language in German, the language Marx uses here to talk about the correct materialist method mirrors very much a moment that he diagnoses way later in the book Capital, namely how it is that um, uh, surplus value is turned into capital, right? So let me just tell you a very quick story that is more complicated than I'll tell you, but the, the main issue is like if you make shoes and I grow corn, we can exchange those things, but only to the extent that I need shoes and you need corn, right? But now, look at what those needs are. Like, you can't obviously eat shoes, and, I mean, unless I'm really creative and so on, I can't wear corn cobs on my feet. Um, so that exchange is based on the really concrete specific material qualities that each of those things have, which are always related to need. Okay, now, if, for example, I work in a factory, um, then I am now producing things that I'm not exchanging, right? And, in fact, whoever then sells those things on the open market, also is not really interested any longer in their qualities that make of them useful to other people. That is, they now have a value that allows them to be exchanged with other things, right? And we, in a way, have it way easier than Marx did because we could mark that value. Like, you could sell those things for dollars, right? And what does dollars mark? It marks something that really radically different things have in common, right? So if I, so let's say I am a pipe fitter. I go to Zion Nuclear Power Plant, which is now closed, but 
Um, and every day I weld the pipes and so on. They produce electricity. I just get a wage, right? Their electricity they sell for dollars, which then whoever they are, they can buy other things with. So dollars mean this, this kind of value that is not useful, right? It marks, be, because by the way, notice, you can't either eat or wear dollars. Um, so maybe you can make clothing out of dollars because they're very durable and waterproof, and maybe that's a thing you should look into is making clothing out of dollars. 14 years later, we're going to talk yeah. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, so Marx's point is, look, don't come to me and talk about abstraction. That shit's already abstract, right? That is already an abstraction. Um, and, and so... He even calls it the violence of abstraction. And one of the things he calls this is, so, I, not to geek out on the German, but he calls this... Gespenstige um, Gegenständlichkeit, ghost-like objectivity. Um, that is, that this is something that doesn't exist like, you know, this or this or... It, so we wouldn't say it exists, but yet, I mean, and this is the nice thing about this ghost-like, is that whoever believes in ghosts would want to say, like, Okay, they're not like tables and chairs and glasses and so on, but they met, like they have effects, like they muck things up, like they do things. Um, and so Marx refers to this as this ghost-like objectivity, I think for precisely this reason. Now, if it turns out that our world is inhabited by ghosts, then this moving rejection of thought means we can't ever say anything about the way our world works. So this is what I think Marx's great insight was. And this is a way of saying I've now come back to realize the smartness of Derrida's specters of Marx, although I think he gets there in the wrong way. Can I just ask, yeah. this rejection of thought and the uneignment, yeah. I mean, with, with the uneignment, you really need the thinking process understand, so it seems like two different, like attention, you have to do an unignal process, yeah. to really understand, and to look through the to really see what's happening, you have to look through, you need a lot of thought for that, yes. and then there's the rejection of thought, which means don't cling to the abstract things, really look, but then isn't there a kind of tension in the emphasis? Um, um, you need thinking. You need thinking. No, I, 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 at least this is my current reading of Marx, is that you cannot reject thinking. Yeah. And then the question is how to reorient the method of thinking so that it can always recognize this other than thought, okay. necessarily other than thought. And I, I, I really like this on Eigen. Um, I, I think it's a really nice, so this make it, so, and, and I think in, a, in interesting ways, the English appropriation is, is nice if we figure out what it means, right? So when you say, like, oh, that thing has been appropriated, um, that means it's been taken away and taken into a different location, but still there is this proper, at the center of it. So it's made, it, it was proper over there, and I've taken it away, and now I've made it proper to me, or this thing, or so on. So I, I think this is not an accidental choice on Marx's part. I think all that's already there in Aquinas, John Locke, too. I mean, what is it that makes something proper to one? Mm. And then Aquinas, of course, had a suspicion as commodity production began to expand and that was, people were coming along who seemed to be able to make money out of money. And what kind of trick is that exactly? You know, yeah. He already had most of the analysis there. Yeah. But on the thought thing, the part of the, in the story you were telling about the sur surplus value as an abstraction that's already going on all the time and doesn't even really need brains to 
think those thoughts, so to speak. I mean, in a way, you could say what you get created in that is, well, for one thing, commodity fetishism, but also to understand that as a kind of, I don't know, counter thought in a certain sense, mm. that, that because it's a mystifying, obscuritist kind of thought where value seems to just appear as if by magic and removed from any labor process. So, of course, this is a big part of the second half of Spectres of Marx, that, right. you know, things just seem to appear without having had to come anywhere and come, come from anywhere, and as far as what the labor process is, whatever, especially as this becomes a, a fully global process, we don't know where anything comes from, basically. So, talk about materialism. Um, I have a material need that I'm going to have to take care of right now. Sure. Otherwise, we're all going to be embarrassed. All right. When you come back, can I ask a question about Aunt Betty and are you what the world was waiting for? Were you what the family was waiting for? Yes. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> and you are the people we have been waiting for. I don't know. I'm hesitant to say anything about Rick here. Well, Bill, then, would you pick up on what, uh, what he's saying about, about Marx, and uh, does that fit into your, you know, they've always talked about the connection between Marx and Mao, and that the Chinese understood uh, Marxism and how they adopted it. Do you come across Marx's literature as you get through Mao? Do I come across Marx's literature as a... Yes, as you, as you look, look at Mao's writing, and you know, they've got... Uh, I met a woman who's in charge of Marxist studies in China, and she said they are rereading Marx in German to oh, understand yeah. what all, you know, how that has or should be able to misunderstand yeah. what we're using. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a whole interesting you know, thing. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which all of these things are being read in China now, but basically very similar to what happened in the Soviet Union, where after a while it was taken up as a kind of legitimating ideology for whatever the party, yeah. the present party position is. So, um, and then of course, I mean, there are some people who are trying to recapture some radical possibilities out of all of that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a complicated, that's a complicated thing. I think I'd rather go to this other point that I, I don't know if I expressed it very well, which is that I think there's a way in which most of what we call Marxism, and this goes, I think, more directly to the materialism question, it's still too much, and this is part of what I see as Mao's contribution, or an opening that he gives us, that it's still too much in the Western monotheistic tradition. And it, and it even tells a kind of Christian story of redemption, or maybe with some twists, like in say, then you mean it, you know, goes back more to a kind of Jewish conception of messianism, but it's still in that vein, and I think the way that it has to do with materialism is that what people then took away from that, and that's, that's the thought that's being negated here, is that what monotheism becomes is monocausality. And where materialism just means that we can find causes and effects. And it's not that there aren't causes and effects, but this, you know, the ghostly appearing and all of that, you'll, you can't hook that up with causes and effects any more than you can in any one-to-one -one kind of way. It, al it always looks for the one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. Any more than in philosophy of mind, you can really look up, the, you can really hook up the plasticity of the things our, our consciousness is capable of in that kind of, you know, the neuronal correlation of consciousness uh, model. And so, you know, the way they, the way the people who are pressing that hard uh, really do it is just like this pain doctor. You know, I have to adapt to the medicine, not the medicine to me. Or I have to adapt to the way the computer understands language which doesn't understand the way the computer has been programmed to work with language um, in a rule-governed way, whereas in reality, when we use language, yeah, I guess there's some loose rules, but we can break them all over the place and still 
somehow managed to communicate. Um, and so here's the here's the big question, though. See, I think um, so. There's a power of thought here for what what Badiou says is that you know politics is an idea, and you know one of his central arguments is that we live in a time calls it an interval, which I think is a very interesting thing because I only learned um, in the last couple of years because the, which one is it, the Prime Minister or the President of uh, France who's, who's having this affair with the woman on the motor scooter or mm-hmm. something. I didn't know that interval meant, was the word they use in France for having an, having an affair. <laughs> Um, nice. uh, which suits bad you very nicely, actually, if you know anything. But in it. French, it's like, like every word a euphemism for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, too. That's true, too. But bad you says that we are living in a time where the crisis of politics is that we lack an idea. And you would think, well, okay, sure, that makes a certain kind of sense, but how is that materialist? And see, I think this kind of argument that Rick was laying out leads us to want to develop that further, you know, yeah. I know that's not a very satisfactory thing to say, but it's much better than to just say, yeah, I'll later for that, because, you know, we got to look for the causes and effects in this mechanical yeah, that's right. kind of way. Well, I would say I find this notion of materialism, which you may argue, so fascinating, because it's so much more than materialism, and it also makes me understand something. But because I think this kind of materialism, which which look to a forthcoming book by Roman Roman and Littlefield later this year. Okay. <laughs> what I find interesting is it's, you know it's a materialism which somehow if I, I try to you know I try to say it in different ways and I, I, I tried and maybe it's a different way off. But it's somehow it has to do with concrete living, with historical, societal, economical um, grown structures out of real living. And in that way, I now understand, or that helps me to understand that this materialism, which just says all this material, and then it some of the points that it's all kind of causal, it's just much more abstract. It's already a very abstract material. In some ways, it's already very thought and yeah. thought materialism. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this materialism is really, it's, one should call it, I don't know, concretism or, or right. something like that. It's just much more really than other, and not an abstraction. Yeah, and, and, and it, it turns out that in this section of, of uh, from Marx that we've read, he doesn't use the word materialism in this section. Um, he uses, it, so he talks mostly about um, the concrete, ein concretes, and so on. But he then refers in, in God, oh, wow, the third afterward maybe or it could be a four to the forward or afterward to the third German edition of Capital he refers to a reviewer who points to quotes this text Marx quotes him at length and says this is what I mean by materialism um, and, and that's the same by the way f- for those of you who know Marx you might be familiar with this famous passage about um, Hegel had the rational kernel of the dialectic and turning Hegel on his head or on his feet or the other way around. Um, it's all from the same thing, where he refers back to this saying, this is materialism. So that's the dead dog passage. People are treating Hegel like a dead yeah. dog. Yeah. We avow ourselves the disciples of that mighty thinker. Yeah. All of that way. But see, I don't think it's causal. So this is not, I mean, I, I wanted to refer it from a materialism where the only point, starting point of which is causal. This is much more intricate and multidimensional. And what I liked about what you said is, is this notion that we think that a, a kind of, let's call it a, a, a mechanical causal account, we think that's not abstract. And what I think Marx is here pointing out, and you were drawing this out, is that actually is already abstract. So let's figure out that abstraction and maybe find out a better abstraction. Well, can I add one thing to that just to go back to the void for a moment too? Because see, 
it's so hard in a certain sense to say, let the void be, let it play its role, let leave it be as void. Because on the reductivist side, they'll say, well, the void is just what we don't understand causally. Yet. Hmm. You just have to fill it. That's that's folk psychology until you get the real account, you know, or folk whatever. And then on the other side, people say, oh, well, that's where the miracle happens. Right. Instead of, you know, and so Badu, whether you like him or not, still what he tries to do is to put that on a mathematical model to sort of try to keep the theological stuff happening, like the demonism, you know, the demonic side is zero in uh, Greek and Arabic mathematics. In fact, that, you know, like in Roman numerals, there isn't even a representation of zero because it's such a scary concept. So that's, that's a hard thing to do. That's precisely where I was going with it. And in fact, I think you, you would, you would be approving to actually go back into that for a second. Because immateriality and materiality are so fluid. And they, they go back and forth. In the way that I'm understanding what you're, the way you're speaking about the void, precisely I think the way you're talking about it, the material and the immaterial are constantly moving one with the other rather than sort of the, the, the way you described it is, is kind of crass. That understanding is a crass understanding of, mm-hmm. of um, what's going on in the void. Yeah, and well, as you know, I tend to be very resistant on this point because... Yeah, we have, we've had Tibetan Buddhism arguments. Well, I have this argument every day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what is the argument in the nature of it? Well, part of it, I don't like the Dalai Lama. I don't, I don't think he's a good person. And, uh, uh, oh God, you're going to have to call Mother Teresa next. Jesus I Christ. Uh, well, there's one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in any case, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, he's not the totality of Tibetan Buddhism anyway. But, um, yeah, I mean, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the idea that there's something in that philosophical lineage or whatever to, to learn from. But uh, it, it's so cluttered. See, part of what I like about Zen is that it's minimalistic. And, I don't know, just ontologically, I tend to think that's, you know. So here's the way I would come at this question about what you call the fluidity of the material and the immaterial. It turns out, and I know you'll be incredibly shocked by this, that when students write evaluations of faculty members, the very same characteristics for which I would be called, for example, strict, um, bold, um, uh, forceful, you would be called such great terms as bitchy, um, uh, conceited, full of yourself, and so on. Well, um, So, there is something going on, right, that is not a thing in the world, right? It's not a table, a chair, it's, so there is something that is materially effective that in it itself is not a material thing. That, I think, is the genius of Marx's philosophy to say, let's focus on that. Because as long as we don't, they're always going to win. So that's another way of looking at that fluidity. And, and I think... But how do you do that without getting a substance dualism? See, that's the... You know, there's an opening to that. And Dun Scotus is the answer. Well, I was wondering when that was going to <laughs> And I, I think you, you find this already in Hegel, and it's in Marx, and I think, but it, I, I think it begins earlier, a notion that our ontology is too small. Like, we think about, does it exist or does it not exist? And that's really small. And, and so maybe the n- next larger thing should be, is it real or not? That has n- nothing to do with existing or non-existing. And I think Marx uses, following Hegel, this term real, much more than he uses existing. Um, so I thought, for example, uh, no, I've talked enough. 
I, I won't say anything. But for me, this has to do with comedy and the Marx Brothers and Hegel and other things, which... I think this is the time for me to tell the bony fish joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> in that there's never a time for you to tell the bony fish joke, this might be it. Uh, it, it's a it's it's a very simple thing. So, in a way, um, a short story of Hegel. He writes this. Uh, he doesn't write. He gives these lectures on the philosophy of fine art, and like Hegel always does, he tells a story about it. Right. So, this art has a story, and it develops through its story. And I will tell you what that story is. And the general form of the story is art is spirit trying to show itself in matter. Right turns out, ultimately, by the way, spoiler alert, that's always going to be a failure because spirit is not matter, and so any time it tries to show itself in matter, it's going to be a failure. But what's interesting about art is the history of that failure. Okay, so the Greeks come along, they try to show spirit in the form of a beautiful human being, right? So that turns out to be a failure because all they showed is how human beings are really great, but not how spirit is really great, and so on and so on, and blah, blah, blah. What's weird is that the end of his story is about tragedy and comedy. And one way this makes sense, where it's not weird, is, oh, here's a moment where art is actually, it's not really so material anymore, right? Because it's in plays, it's in drama, it's in, and so it's, it's freed itself from a certain kind of materiality. So he says, okay, look, what is tragedy? Here's tragedy. There's a person, we learn them as the tragic hero. Um, they are in confrontation with the ethical norms of the society in which they live. That's the matter of the problem, right? That's what gets, that's what makes it a drama. Their intention, and what's the resolution? Society wins, usually in the form of killing the hero, which is a kind of resolution, right? You, 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 you kill the one who's, who's the outlier, and that then reaffirms the ethical norms of the social whole. He says, though, in comedy, in fact, the opposite turns out, that it is the comedic persona who rises above the ethical norms of the social whole. And how does the comedic persona do this? He says, because the comedic persona is the one who recognizes that even false appearances form a part of reality. And the comedic persona becomes then a master of appearances. And so I wanted to show this episode of uh, the scene from A Night at the Opera, a Marx Brothers movie. I don't know if you know the Marx Brothers, but um, so the, the story is through all sorts of underhanded, nefarious means, um, the three Marx brothers and some of the central characters come from Italy back to the U.S. on all sorts of false promises, but there's a really great opera singer who comes from a poor background and won't get the time of day in any opera house. And they then connive and scheme and so on, and they get him finally to perform, and, and he wins the day. But there's a scene in which they haven't paid the rent. In, they're all in the U.S. illegally. They haven't paid the rent in their really fancy two-room uh, hotel suite. And so the police come to their two-room hotel suite. So as they're arguing with the police, they keep switching out the living room for the bedroom, right? And they keep doing this until there comes the end of the scene is when Groucho Marx and Harpo Marx Harpo's in drag are sitting now at a breakfast table eating and they look like two um, Jewish refugees from uh, Russia in the 1930s and they're eating breakfast and they say, I, I don't, who are you looking for? I don't get it. And this shows like they are the master of appearances, right? And, and so I, I think here Hegel is pointing out that there are lots of things that are real, that have real effects in the world, that are not physically, materially existing things, and we need to, to figure that out.
things from cooling. But why do we need to say that they're not material things? So, I mean, I know one thing that struck me some years ago was reading an article in Scientific American by someone talking about latest developments in quantum theory and saying that, well, we, now we know too much about matter to be materialists anymore. And what struck me is the more proper conclusion is, well, we know, we know more, we know enough about matter to not be reductivist and to know that it, there's a lot of really weird stuff going on and that not all relations are, are causal relations. But it doesn't make me want to say And, and again, that's where the void seems to me to be absolutely necessary and to leave it be, so to speak, because otherwise you're going to be filling it in. You're going to use it as, well, that's just the placeholder until something else. But, but then the people who are, uh, the reductionists who are eventually hoping that neurology will uh, reveal how it's possible to have subjective experiences are really beating a dead horse in a sense. It's never going to happen. Yeah. Now, it's funny how not only persistent they are, but I mean, it's the dominant paradigm by far. Yeah. And even, you know, like even, the, you know, the philosophers like Hilary Putnam, who were champions of the computational theory of mind and then gave it up 30 or 40 years ago now, but still all these MIT types and whatnot, they still yeah. absolutely believe it. And every little every little test, you know, they've never had, I mean, to me, one of the ironic things in the world now is that, uh, that computers can quite readily pass the Turing test, and we know they don't have artificial intelligence. Now, most people can't pass a Turing test, so that's sort of the problem, uh, you know, or a Chinese room experiment or whatever, but, you know, so that's the world we're Also meant now. in a non-racist way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You think the Chinese room experiment is a racist uh, characterization? Yes. Really? So maybe I, so I'm just going to... My, my family lives all throughout the U.S., and we can't always get together to celebrate Christmas, which is our family holiday, near the holiday, and so we just celebrate it over the weekend. And my father's opening racist salvo included the word Chinaman, and it just went down from there. So, um, Why, when the philosophers were the same, um, how society was going to be created, why don't they look at why are we creating a society in the first place? Like the reason for it. Um, not in terms of we have extra food and now we should have positions, but like what is the value system of, what will be the value system of the society we create? So therefore you're taking the full, you know, the philosophical and abstract and seeing how it will apply, like for example, in terms of race, to how it will apply in the real world when we create this world. So look at how the, the thinking applies to will have a practical effect in creating you know, systems or even laws or whatever. Right, there's an application to them. So why aren't they looking when they say, why aren't they instead of saying, oh look, people, or or, or we have thoughts, why isn't it, what, what if, why are we creating this and what do we want to be? Why don't they do that? I mean, why don't people just kind of try to imagine a perfect society and then, or, or a good society and then, and then go from there? I don't know about perfect. Or well, not, yeah, I mean, not that's, spoken, that's but, not a good word. But, but a, 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 per, a why, a value system for which it will exist. You know, like, we want the society to do something, you know, provide... Um, quality for all people, or, or keep people highly motivated, um, starting there rather than, you know, there's like goods and things and production, and, you know, like the, the overall value of the culture, the reason for being. Like there's one country that has the gross national happiness, 
so a different way of looking at how we value, you know, how, how we take the, the philosophical to the practical and what we do with thought and when we apply the thought. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, and, and this may go back to the, this previous discussion, um, for me, one of the, um, okay, so first thing, I think values are on the table all the time, especially when we're not talking about them, right? And, and so, um, you, even in universities they, these days, we hear things about, for example, efficiency, and um, that's a value, right? Um, or, for example, I'm, I'm now running our department's teaching practicum. That is, I discuss with our graduate students who are beginning to teach about teaching. And often they say, well, but how do I do X? And, of course, the obvious question is, well, is that something you should do anyhow? Like, what do you, what, what do you want to achieve and why? And, and so values, I think, are always in play. But you know when they're not in play? Whenever we're just thinking everything's mechanical and it's just this hits that and so on. And I think a lot of this discussion about reducing mind to neurology and, and mechanistic, uh, all philosophical problems will be solved scientifically is precisely a way to act as if values are not in play. Um, so I'm, I'm with you. I think Marx, though, is one philosopher. I think uh, there are a lot of others who I, in the end, don't agree with, like Hobbes, for example, who would say exactly this. Like, yes, let's finally just talk about values. But that requires a, a, um, developing habits of thinking that are not just mechanistic, they're not um, uh, uh, automatic, they need cultivation um, in all sorts of ways. And so um, that doesn't directly address your question, but I think with only one, maybe two or three exceptions, Philosophers don't set out to recreate society. They almost always set out to legitimize the society that already exists. Yeah, I mean, Marx does. Too, too. Right. I mean, Marx does. You know, when the idea becomes a material force, then the revolution is going to happen, and the proletarians will rise. And I mean, that's I think that's precisely what you're asking. And so Marx sort of does that, although he doesn't give us a reason because it's not those prior. To but, you know, what Marx actually said, though, and this was originally in, it's in my stuff, but, uh, is when the interconnections are grasped, yes. theory becomes a material force. And so then a lot hinges on what that means. And again, I think the allegory of the cave is interesting because there has to be a clearing. I mean, this goes to what Rick was just saying. I mean, how are people susceptible to something that's more like critical thought than mere, rather than mere instrumental thought? Well, there has to be a clearing. There has to be a break. Uh, there has to be something that opens the way to an appreciation for thinking differently, which is thinking. I mean, uh, you know, there's some very interesting stuff in Badiou about the problem today is to break with consensus. And the state organizes consensus and it, it sets the parameters of what's possible. And even philosophers, sometimes especially philosophers, go around just sort of fitting their thought into that into that consensus. There has to be some moment where we're just knocked on our ass, basically. And then, what did you say? Yeah, so I think it's suffering. People, in terms of race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, religion, you come in and out of it based on, I think, suffering. If you're not suffering, like white people are suffering now, that's good. Like, until they're suffering. Really? Where? They're losing their houses. Um, there's actual suffering. That's big that, time suffering. Then people, <laughs> people start to question from suffering, you know, well, maybe things should be different because I don't feel good now. As long as they feel good, they just keep going with whatever they got, because that's work. 
Ja, I, 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 I smell what you're stepping in and I agree with it, but one of the problems with putting it entirely on suffering is that, um, so there have been vast movements, uh, for example, Trotskyism is in one way you've just given the basic principle, like make sure that the system shows itself in its most blunt, ugly fashion, and that will bring about the revolution. Um, so, you know, I had a friend as a graduate student who was big into this position, and he thought everyone should vote for Ross Perot. Maybe a lot of you don't remember Ross Perot, but the man was a little bit of an idiot, crazy man. Um, He's like a character in a Robert Heinlein. Yeah, or someone that uh, Dana Carr, you know, now this is to say the same uh, era. Um, anyhow, um, but I, I think there's another, the, the, there is another route to it. So, I mean, here's an example. I have lots of friends who, you know, one of them works for a company that makes slot machines that go in hotels. Another person works for Morningstar, the mutual fund rating company. Um, and they are constantly making fun of me or criticizing me for not working, right? Like, so what do you do? You know, oh, you have two classes in an entire quarter. So then what do you do with the rest of your time? Um, and then when I say, oh, I have office hours, and then I have to admit, like, none of you ever come to office hours. And so, so, like, but, you know, we have to be, okay. Whatever, they're the ones who criticize me. You know who never criticizes me? My Aunt Peggy, or, you know, all of my uncles who are pipe fitters, they are never criticizing me. And I think that's not suffering. That's something like hope or, or something. Um, that is that I know it could be otherwise. And there is a moment from... The perspective of not suffering, so the woman who works for the slot machine company and Morningstar and so on, they look at me and they realize that, in fact, since all I do for a living is think, I can show them for the lie they're living. Whereas from the other side, from the pipe fitters, they realize that all I do is think is the hope they've perhaps been waiting for. But maybe it's, you know, and I'm big on, I've been thinking a lot about conscious and subconscious, but maybe on the side of your family, consciously or subconsciously, they are suffering, and they would have liked to spend this time thinking, and therefore they're happy that you now have this opportunity to think. And on the side of the capitalists that you're talking about, like you said, they're suffering because they know you're smarter than they are, because you get to sit around and read and write and think, so you can outthink them and you can see through them and you can destroy their thing. But maybe the, I mean, maybe if your family, I don't know, maybe, maybe they maybe they are suffering. Maybe they, maybe they feel like they would be happier if they were thinking, or maybe they're happy that somebody in their family has time to, even if they don't know what this thing is, like you said, live this thing that's something other than like it. Yeah. So all I'm saying is the recognition it could be otherwise, right? And that's not, I, I, I'm not willing to always call that suffering. Um, because I, just as a small aside, I'm always worried about the way in which suffering then becomes a noble kind of thing. And I don't think it should ever be made noble. Um, and so I realize all I want to say is whatever the case is, there are people who recognize it could and perhaps should be otherwise. Um, I want to restate that in a very abstract way, just to go back to the abstract, too. I think that one of the problems in the way Marx takes over the dialectic from Hegel is in the whole question of mitigation of mitigation. And I think, again, one point for stating something like a break avoid, etc., is this question of, and I don't think you get this from kind of a logic of suffering that's going to unfold 
somehow at a certain point it's going to make this big, big U-turn and go the other way, is that there has to be something like an affirmation that is something beyond simply the negation of the negation of yeah. itself out through, through suffering. Yeah. And for there to be that, there has to be some moment of break. I mean, yes, of course, suffering is a part of the picture, just like political economy is a part of the picture. Right. Just like um, the uh, tendency of the rate of, uh, of uh, profit to decline, or the rate of, uh, of um, sorry, you know, the, the, the labor that is, you know, the, the dead labor that is congealed in, in capital mm -hmm. to rise, you know, the rise in organic composition of capital. Um, you know, all that's, of course, part of the picture, but there has to come some moment where there is something else. There's just something else entirely, and you can't have that unless there's some pre-moment, and I'm not saying I understand exactly the relationship, but there's something like, I don't know, the John the Baptist before, mm -hmm. you know, before the Messiah comes um, that clears the way. Right. Even even saying I don't know what it is yet, really, but it's coming, right. and it's and it's going. It's already pointing in that other direction instead of just the negation of negation. Yeah. I would like to kind of um, combine the question: Why don't philosophers just say focus on how we could do better? Do I understand you? Actually, why don't they focus on what we could do and bring a change? The value of the system. The value of the system. Why don't they change the value of the system and and your um, anecdote, anecdote to what are what is the work of the And I think a lot of suffering, and that's maybe that's just another aspect. Um, a lot of a lot of suffering comes from wrong thinking or stagnated thinking. You know, we, we are somehow tr always again trapped in ways of thinking that produce a lot of suffering. In medieval times, and you're a woman, and you do uh, wrong things, uh, you are just immediately identified with certain uh, ways uh, that that cause tremendous suffering, and it's a lot of work to change the way we think. Because I mean, thinking, and that's also interesting for us. Thinking is a real environment. We move in our values and, and structures and orientations, and we think in that way, that way, and then. Always again, this is shifted and changed, but it's a lot. It's a lot of work. If you think, you know, those really original thinkers, how they had to think themselves through with old notions to new ways, which haven't been thought before, and cleared the way. And that's like also another. It's not just the boy. It's real work of thinking. So we can really think different as it has, as it has never been thought before. And I think. That's the work of the philosophers, you know, like if you look at Hannah Arendt and how she understood what totalitarianism is about, or if you look at Kant, who really tries to understand it's not just skepticism or dogmatism or empiricism, or if you look at the American pragmatists, or they really think their way through a lot of work. And, it, and I think it, 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 it creates new ways of living, sometimes really with, with their suffering. I think you know, I'm curious as to earlier you said uh, that the turn away from thinking from the abstract can be blamed in a lot of ways for the failures of sort of the communist movements in China or Russia or wherever. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you mean by that and like how you think that. Because like I understand definitely how. Uh, sort of reductionist thinking kind of maintains capitalism and maintains the aggressive system we live under because it kind of reduces everything to this is objectively how it works. But it seems like like what what led that to happen to the communist countries too, just because I feel like since they were trying to initiate that break with uh, with sort of orthodox ways of thinking. So this is the kind of stuff that always gets Bill Martin and me in trouble whenever we're around Marxists because um, we are on different sides of Marxism, but both of them are the wrong sides. <laughs> um, so um, it's a really long, complicated question, and, and 
for me at least, and you probably would agree, um, after 1989, when like you know the actual the existing socialist countries, with the exception of Cuba and, and China, like fell by the wayside, I, I think a lot of Western, Northern and Western countries stopped thinking about the history of Marxism, socialism, Marxist socialism, and so on. And even, you know, let's say from the time of the Russian Revolution until even into the, you know, early 20s. So, I mean, we're talking a really short period of time. A lot of problems came up and, and uh, they were debated internationally um, or at least maybe Europe-wide. Um, and there's a moment where I think Engels' version of Marxism came out on top. And Engels was much more, always much more mechanistic, scientistic, and even to a certain extent what later became called economistic. That is, everything you ever want to talk about can be just reduced to the economy. Um, and I think because the role that the Soviet Union came to play then within the world of socialism in general, um, that became in many ways the prevailing way of thinking. Um, and it's not often, often thought about the way in which, for example, Mao in China was not a Stalinist, um, was really a, a, a kind of Leninist and an advance on Lenin, but certainly not a Stalinist. And those tensions we no longer understood, I think, outside of that sphere. And so there are a lot of reasons having to do with personalities and accidents. I mean, so here's just one accident. Lenin dies. Lenin wants Trotsky to take over the, the party. His will is in the hands of his wife. Stalin um, intervenes, talks with his wife, and suddenly now that uh, decision of Lenin's is pushed aside and Stalin becomes the victim. That has nothing to do with capitalism, socialism, whatever, or maybe it does, I, I don't know. But it's a kind of accident that actually had an effect on the way in which we now are willing to take up or unwilling to take up all of these issues having to do with Marx, materialism, communism, and so on. So, I mean, it, it, it becomes a really complicated, but it's a really interesting history. Starting from, for example, the second international, um, what's the full name of the international? Uh, yes. Um, I, I think it already begins there. And they killed Rosa. Sorry? And they killed Rosa. They killed Rosa, they killed Trotsky. Yeah, they got Trotsky, man. Um, if I could, I, I mostly agree with that. I mean, the role of contingency, I think, is something. I mean, this again goes back to the monotheism and monocausality, but it has a very hard time allowing scope for contingency, much less what I think is really the, you know, what has to be embraced, which is that contingency is deeper than necessity. So it's not just a matter of saying, um, you know, it, it, there, here's a good example of Engels where he said freedom is sort of what we what we carve out of necessity by coming to understand the way the laws uh, of necessity work. And that doesn't sound very much like freedom to me, that you just understand what, how, what piece of the machine you are. Um, Didn't he say freedom is just another word for another word you use. <laughs> Synonyms, just another oh, word yeah, yeah, yeah. for the yeah. other word you want to use. Right. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, that's one of the greatest songs ever. This is from the, uh, what, what did they end up calling the Joni Jimlin story or something? 30 Rock, 30 the series Rock. 30 Rock and 
they wanted to do this movie on Janis Joplin, but they couldn't get any of the rights to her music. So she's got the song, Freedom's Just Another Word for Nothing Left to Lose, but they couldn't use that lyric, and so the lyric they replaced it with was, synonyms, just another word for the word you meant to use. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's brilliant. Um, I mean, in some sense, I mean, for one, I don't quite agree with Lenin thinking that Trotsky was the guy, because I, I will say that I think it's pretty clear, just to, as a matter of kind of history, right or wrong, but I don't think the Bolsheviks would have ev ever accepted Trotsky as their leader. For some reasons that I think were right and some that were wrong, including anti-Semitism. Um, um, but in some way, Stalin made sense within a certain logic as who would emerge in the sense that I think Lenin's conception of the party is that it prefigures the state. It's the party state conception. And, and Stalin was nothing if not a man of the state, so to speak. And the state wants stability. I mean, this was the whole problem that never got worked out, even in I mean, the Cultural Revolution in China was a sort of wild and, and at times crazy and terroristic and anarch, anarchic in a, in a bad sense attempt to sort of throw everything at that model and force a new model, but they failed. And so whatever success there was of it was in the attempt to do that, but they never really found a new model. And, I, and I've actually come to think that maybe given that we haven't found that model yet or either, even though we think we're so bloody smart, whatever, after the fact, that maybe, you know, there are, there are revolutions that are just defeated. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just because you're right and just because you're revolutionary doesn't mean you're going to win. Sometimes the other forces have, have more going for them. And, yeah. you know, if Deng Xiaoping can say, you know, haven't you had enough of... Uh, of a lower standard of living because we're trying to support people in Vietnam and we're trying to rejig production in ways that sometimes lead to gross failures. Wouldn't you rather sort of settle all this down, have a kind of normal management system and have a television? And after 10 years of very chaotic times, and especially in certain periods between basically around 1967 and 68, a lot of people were ready for that when, when yeah. Mao died. I mean, I was thinking about this when we were talking about this last night with the other group that I'm doing. But, um, you know, when Stalin died, um, you know, there was an outpouring of tremendous love for Stalin. You know, thousands and thousands of people, you know, millions even were at the, you know, at the funeral of Stalin, even to the point where the, the pressure of all the people were such that people fell into the grave and died. And some even apparently jumped in. It was very similar with the case of Ayatollah Khomeini, actually. And there was a real, there was another similarity there too, which is that what Stalin did was he made Marxism into a kind of state religion, progressively, not in all one swoop, but you know, if you read these, and I don't know that Trotsky was necessarily better about this. I mean, it was a fascinating period after Lenin died all the leaders of the Bolsheviks, you know, uh, even once most people haven't even heard like Preo Brzezinski or Jana, I can't even pronounce that, but or Jana Kidze, or however you say that name. I know I'm not saying it correctly, but they all wrote sort of manifestos of what was this Leninist moment that led us to the October Revolution and how do we keep that going? But then the other thing was too, and, and Mao I think did recognize this very clearly, and I think it is an important advance, at least on the level of thought. If you're getting anywhere, that doesn't mean you just have solution to problems. You also have new problems. And that was the thing that Stalin could never wrap his head around, because it, for one thing, it required creative thought. And everything was set up, I think, not just in Stalin. I mean, Stalin was not an idiot, okay? He wasn't maybe a genius, 
he obviously wasn't the genius of the proletariat, but he wasn't a moron. Um, but the idea that you would be creative and do experiments and try things as opposed to just, well, let's draw up a plan. And the fact is, when they planned the Soviet economy, I mean, they really did not know what they were doing no. at all. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, and, 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 you know and, and one reason, of course, is nobody had ever done anything like this before. But another reason was they, they were afraid to do anything creative. They basically had a religious dogmatism uh, about all of that. And, uh, all of which is to say, by the way, back to your original question, yeah. is that the, the actual answer to your question is really historically complicated and also really historically interesting. And it's a kind of history very few people seem so interested in these days. And I think one reason is um, because... You know, Bill and I have been on panels together, and you say the slightest negative thing about Stalin at a certain gathering, and people are, like, ready to string you up. And then you say something positive about Trotsky, and then you're thinking, I'm going to get an ice pick in the back of my head. And, like, so even among Marxists, they don't want to discuss this history because it just brings up these tensions because it seems all clear. And I think Bill and I are much more willing to say, you know, we have different sides of really the same road, um, but we're more willing to say, look, the history is interesting in all its complications, so just tell it. Like, don't worry uh, about who looks ugly and whatever. It's, it's, it's interesting. And um, as history always is, like, people are trying to do the best thing they can at the time, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I, I think Stalin was more on the idiot side than Bill does, but, um, or unless you want to say George W. Bush was not an idiot, and I'm willing to hear that argument, but then I think they're the same kind of non-idiot. Um, but, anyway. I guess when I what I have I'm so confused about is how does that relate to sort of the separation between the material and the immaterial? Which you really have the material world and the abstract world? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to say something that I think describes the new problem that arose that the solution to which has not been found, which is that, you know, Marx said that the working people have no country in some interpretations, it's even they have no fatherland or no motherland, but they have a world to win. But then when you have a revolution, and I mean, you know, let's face it, Russia is one-sixth of the world's landmass, so that's not anything to sneeze at. Well, then all of a sudden, is that in, let's own the assumption that it was in some sense, maybe even in some very degraded sense, but whatever, that it was in some sense a workers' revolution that represented, at least in some there's abstraction for you in a very abstract way, you know, um, the aspirations of the workers in some sense or the international proletariat. Well, now you can't say they have no country. They've just ripped away one-sixth of the world's landmass from the rest of the, the global social order. But what do they do with that? What do they do with that? And so then there was this very obviously dogmatic and and orthodox, everything that was done was done under the banner of orthodoxy, too. You could claim the orthodoxy. Yeah. But this idea of saying that new contradictions actually emerge, and that, yes, yeah, some things are solved, but then there are new problems. And, it's, and see, I don't think we've got that. I think what we know now, I think what we have to be able to say now is that the party state conception where you overturn the existing state, I mean, which I'm still all for, but where you then say, and now we're going to set up another state. Right. And then the state's just going to grow and there's no withering away of the state. You know, it's like, well, that happens at some point. It's on the horizon, and as they say, the horizon's always receding. That model. So, one other thing, and it's getting kind of late, and so we should end this, but um, 
there's a, a, a philosopher that I really admire who, in conversation with someone else, once tried to make a distinction between, um, uh, uh, let's say, something like uh, Marxist philosophy and uh, revolutionary theory. Um, do you know who that guy is? I do. Um, it's Bill. Um, and, and so, like, I, I, like, there are all sorts of things that I'm not the right person to go to, and, like, how, do, how does this happen, how does that happen, I don't know. But when I hear your question, what comes to my mind is that um, from at least Aristotle, if not before, philosophy in the West has been, it seems to me, overwhelmingly concerned with the question of what. What is it? What is? Um, and so on. And this leaves to the side the question of how. And one of the things I think Marx brings to the fore is more this question of how. In which case then, material, immaterial, existing, non-existing, those are dichotomies that the question of the how doesn't matter, right? So how how does this appear to be a table? How do people come to organize themselves in this way? How does it happen that it, once you start talking about the question of how, which in classical German book, philosophical vocabulary, would be the question of mediation, right? That's the, the mode. How does this happen? Um, then I think um, all of these concrete problems come into much closer contact with the, the philosophical approach to them, um, as long as I focus on how rather than what and why. Um, so, how is it that goes still? And so, I mean, this is a new problem. Like, it, it turns out that we could talk about capitalism and there's a way in which it's the same, right? But there's a way in which it's not the same, and the way in which it's not the same is the how. Right? So that there is value that's extracted, as Marx would say, without equivalence. That's a pretty good running definition of capitalism. But that's not the same when I read, you know, Dickens' description of a factory, or Marx's for that matter, and when I look at Google, right? That doesn't seem the same. Um, and how to mark that difference, it's not in the what, it's in the how. And the how matters, and we have new problems because the how of capitalism has changed, and so the how of analysis must change, and the how of, of the resolution of that must change also. That's my final answer to that. Final answer? Do you want to call it? Lifeline? How do you consider Marx's critique or indictment any less of an ideological constraint than the paradigm you introduced as reductivist materialism? Yeah, so um, I'm 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 someone who believes that grammar should always be descriptive, which means that native speakers don't make mistakes in language. So I realize that ideology has now come to mean, oh, it's the thing you happen to believe, right? But, so I know that that's what it means. Um, but for Marx, who's not the inventor of it, but I mean, even before Marx, it has a relatively specific meaning. And the relatively specific meaning it has is that constructs of thought are now posited as real things outside of thought, right? So that's what ideology means. So in the sense that to the extent that Marx is trying to philosophize in a way as to always pre prevent the constructs of thought from being assumed to be the reality of actually existing things, 
then by definition that philosophy can't be ideological, right? I don't find that to be the case. I, I know there are texts that you can point to. We, you know, for example, there are some texts in the German ideology where he talks about the superstructure base model and so on. I, I, I find the overwhelming of Marx's text not to be reductive in that sense. Um, I think where he's really reductive in that sense is in his theory or non-theory of culture. Mm. where there's this idea that culture can never be at a, le a level, whatever that means, a level higher than the level of, of the relations of production. Right. And therefore he gets into this mess of sort of the idea that, well, Beethoven was great sort of for the bourgeois era, but somehow the proletarian era will produce somebody greater than Beethoven. Mm. And then, you know, it's sort of silly on the face of it, even though I believed it for, whatever, 30 years or something. But, you know, if you actually really think about it aesthetically, somebody like Beethoven or John Coltrane or whatever, what does that even mean, better than? There's going to be something better than that. I, I you know, I, I, I don't, you know, or that Beethoven's better than Bach for that matter or whatever. Right. You know, I, so, so there's got to be some other way to understand that. Yeah. That's right. And there, I think it is pretty reductive. Well, and, I, and partly because he doesn't really, because there's reductivism built into it in the sense that he doesn't really develop the category of culture. Uh, and then you, you see interesting things that are very hard to explain in these terms, like, for example, in the Meiji uh, Restoration in Japan, when they gave up the gun and went back to using swords and whatnot, you know, stuff like that. that can't really explain that in terms of the development of the relations of production and growth of capital. You know. But I also think it points back to what you said before about Engels kind of winning. Yeah. Right. So a lot of Marx has read through Engels, where a lot of those tensions are forgotten about. There's so That's many right. tensions. About. Yeah. So I think we're a lot of what you read, where you're coming from, is more of those things. So you'll find, you know, so even in, in the Soviet Union when Lenin was still alive, so I have in mind, you know, people like uh, uh, Bakunin or, or Bakhtin, um, and then later people like, I mean, Bukharin. Oh, Bukharin, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, and even later, philosophers like, let's say, Adorno, who's not in, in many ways an orthodox Marxist, but they do come to confront exactly the issue Bill is, is raising. Namely, um, it could be the case that the very way in which Marx was so willing to analyze the economic base could actually, with very little changes, be also used to analyze the cultural level as an independent entity, right? And so, let's say, for example, one of the things that makes art art is that it has a material component and that matter is somehow formed in some way, right? Now you have this kind of tension between the, the, the formal component and the material component. Adorno will be someone who will look at the late Beethoven and say, you know what, it, what's really interesting here is he has so pushed the formal development of, let's say, something like Sonata to the point where it actually makes the material break. And strangely, as what Marx would call a completely bourgeois musician, he makes this really amazing music, which also is probably the adequate expression of the broken society of his time, right? Like maybe that confrontation is 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 much better than I I, have, I hate to say it, but like the bullshit didactic art that was produced under Stalin in the Soviet Union and in Poland and and, uh, and so on. So um, there is, I think, Bill's right. This this kind of I'm not sure I would agree that it's a reduction, but it's. Um, Everything in Marx where there's a gap 
someone will fill it in, critics, followers, whatever. And there are a lot of gaps in Marx, right? So, like, what socialism looks like turns out really ginormous gap in Marx. Like, I could fit, like, what that will look like uh, on, uh, like, in the palm of my hand. I mean, like, nothing. And that will always be filled in. And it will be filled in, you know, oh, everyone will be the same and no one can make choices. And so that's, uh, as a criticism, all have to use the same toothbrush. All have to use the same toothbrush. All wear gray. And so that will be filled in as critics and it's filled in by followers, right? So, whereas, I mean, why can't you just say, you know what, Marx didn't say this. Like, so now we have to think it. And you know what, that means we have to leave Marx aside a lot. Um, in Marx's own name, or I mean, if he, but so now I, I got a little soapboxy there at the end, and um, my wife always tells me I should. My wife always tells me I should say to people, I shout because I'm excited, not because I'm angry. <laughs> Although you know, now I would really like to smoke, and so anger is starting to creep in because of a nicotine and you, you, you can answer this question very quickly. Do you agree? Yeah. You know. We were talking about this in one of my other classes. I mean, Adorno thought Schoenberg is it. And if you're not sort of part of Schoenberg's school, everything else sucks. Wrong. And including Prokofiev and Shostakovich. Shostakovich, you know, yes. But he has arguments for it. Not, the argument is not he's not Schoenberg. The argument has to do with the recuperation of uh, folk without... Um, being uh, critical, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and his argument in favor of Schoenberg is exactly this thing I said, the form content argument. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're right about that, do you? With Shostakovich? I, I'm not the one to say. I mean, just like this whole thing about jazz, where it's it's just that slave beat, so to speak. You know? Yeah, beat but, to the beat. but he's right about the jazz he knew. That's right. Yeah. He's totally right. Well, it's some of it. He didn't know much. It turns out. He didn't know much, but that's not entirely his fault. Whose fault is it? George Gershwin? Uh, maybe Gershwin. I don't know. It's the fault of radio. It's it, it's the fault of the the relation between uh, the modes of production and who owns the airwaves and, and um, all sorts of things he analyzed in his Princeton study when he first came to the United States. You know, Well, should we thank our audience? Thank you all for coming out. I'm yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Bill and I, it turns out, even though we're colleagues, we don't get to talk as much as we would like to. It's like so, ever. Like ever. And it's our fault, not yours, but somehow you all got subjected to our talking to each other. So, sorry for that, and I hope you got a little something out of it. At least you have two pages of paper, which is not helpful.